So the title of my talk is What Might It Mean for Security to be Sustainable? Well, what do we mean by this? Well, people are worried at the moment about the Internet of Things. Now, embedded systems have been around for a long time. You know, we've been working on these since the 1970s. But all of a sudden, we're getting to the point that just about everything you buy for more than about 10 bucks and that you don't eat or drink it seems to have a CPU in it and communications. So what's this going to mean for people in our trade? Well, the early running has been made by privacy. Um, the Samsung Smart TV um, was found to be getting turned into a room bug by the CIA. And the German government found that the Kayla doll could be used in the same way, right? It would listen into your kid's bedroom without you knowing and without you being able to stop it. So they banned that as a product and told everybody in Germany to take it back to the shop and get their money back. But is this going to be revolutionary? Because after all, your phone already hears everything that you do, and it's full of adware, and it carries you around, it, it, it follows you around as you walk, um, you know, um, it's, it's already a known vector, so what is there new if the same can be done to your car or to your kids' toys? The next thing that people worried about was denial of service. Last October, for example, the Mirai botnet took down Twitter for five hours on the U.S. Eastern Seaboard, basically a, a DDoS attack that was run by a couple of hundred thousand CCTV cameras. But again, is that something new? We already have botnets. There are just people manufacturing more things that can be infected. Now, as we've been looking at this, it's occurred to me that safety looks like the real pressure point for the future. And the reason for this is quite simple. Phones and laptops, where we've got lots of experience of insecurity, don't kill many people, at least not directly. Maybe if you spend too much time in front of your laptop rather than at the gym, it will kill you indirectly, but direct kills are rare. But that's not the, not the case once we start putting cars online and medical devices. So this is going to change the game. And last year, in the spring and early summer, Aaron Leverett, Richard Clayton, and I did a project for the um, European Commission's Research Centre. And what the European Union wanted to know is what's going to happen to safety regulation once cars, medical devices, and hundreds of other things in over a dozen industries that they regulate for safety, once all these things go online. And so we looked at three specific verticals, at road vehicles, at medical devices, and electrotechnical equipment. But the lessons that we learned are rather widely applicable. And what I'm going to do today is to try and draw out some strategic possible future directions for the security research community. Now, the EU's problem statement was relatively straightforward. The European Union regulates safety in many industries. And the Internet of Things uh, puts communications and software in many of the things that are regulated. And this creates new safety risk around security. So how will security and safety relate to each other over the next 20 years? And in fact, if you look at the languages that most people in Europe speak, security and safety are the same thing. Uh, in French, it's sûreté. In German, it's Sicherheit. In Italian, it's Sicurezza. And in fact, it seems to be just about English as the language that differentiates between the two. But nonetheless, these are two very different cultures, two different groups of engineers who go about their tasks in different ways and who go to different conferences. So how do we update safety regulation and safety regulators to cope with a world in which you suddenly have all sorts of online threats, software exploits, and other bad things that are familiar from the world of phones and laptops? Well, a bit of background. Um, markets can do safety in some industries better than others. Aviation is a good example of a place where safety more or less happens of its own accord. Um, airlines don't want to have crashes. Um, airplane vendors don't want their planes to crash. And pilots certainly do not want to be involved in plane crashes because they get to the scene of the accident first. But cars are different. And for the first 70 or 80 years of the motor vehicle's existence on Earth, cars were really dreadful. There were no seat belts. The manufacturers put on more chromium and fancy ornaments that would disembowel any pedestrian who was unlucky enough to be involved in a collision with them. Eventually, the American campaigner Ralph Nader 
wrote a book, Unsafe at Any Speed, and he fired up the public. He got the insurance industry involved, and this led in the 60s to the creation of the National Highways Transportation and Safety uh, uh, Authority. Eventually, thanks to the Ford Pinto case, you got uh, regulation that was reasonably effective arising in America. In Europe, there's a different trajectory, but we got to the same place. We've got the Product Liability Directive, which says that you can't disclaim liability just by clicking on a box, and a Framework Directive on approving cars and much else. Now, the pattern here is that you've got some broad principles and many detailed rules. Now, how does this change once cars can get hacked? Here is an example, which you may have seen a few years ago at IEEE Security and Privacy. This is from Yoshi Kono's Car Shark paper. And we'll be applying your brakes shortly. Uh, right about now. Ooh, yeah, that works. Ooh, oh. is he going to go to the wall? <laughs> so they found that a late model Ford could be hacked, and that was Yoshi in the chase vehicle, going along behind the, the, the test car there, and he found that he was able to control everything except the steering from his laptop. So he could lock and unlock the doors, he could um, operate the accelerator pedal, he could operate the brakes, and this creates the obvious possibility for mischief. Uncommanded accelerations kill people. If you can do that at scale, you know, you have got a really, really scary attack. So the industry started to think about this, but there wasn't very great public alarm um, until um, the, um, there was a further attack in, in 2015. Now, the background here is that your traditional car makers are moving to autonomy in a whole lot of little steps. Firms like Mercedes are doing adaptive cruise control, automatic emergency braking, automatic lane keeping, and so on, while the challengers like Google and Tesla are moving faster. And given that Google and Tesla are IT firms, first and foremost, uh, they've started off with software in, in industry methodologies. So Tesla is already doing monthly software upgrades. And one of those basically brought in the autopilot system as a feature. Others are racing to follow. Ford and BMW have both done over-the-air updates. And Toyota says it will be doing this regularly by 2019. And when we look at this, one of the first problems that come to mind is, um, how are you going to transfer the software industry's way of working to cars? One problem is that testing is hard. The test rig to test a car the so-called test car, is an enormous rack of equipment which contains instances of all the electronics in the car, plus measuring equipment and all the rest of it. And it's big, it's expensive, and it gets recycled for new models. So if you have to maintain the capability to test and patch software, how are you going to do that for 20 years? Right? Lots and lots of cars are, are driven for 20 years or more. The average age of a car in the UK at scrappage is now 14 years and cars now tend to last well over 200,000 kilometers, rather than 30 years ago when at 100,000 kilometers they were dead. So here's the first problem that we come up with. How are we going to patch this year's car in 20 years' time? Here's the second thing that we looked at, medical devices. This is the um, intensive care unit at um, Swansea, um, at the hospital there. Um, how many CPUs can you see in this picture? How many computers? Here's a hint. So when your um, new autonomous car has a software glitch and hits a tree and you end up here, you will end up depending for your life on perhaps 20 or 30 computers. And here, too, things go wrong. Here's an example of why. Safety usability. All the controls for the different pieces of medical equipment that you find tend to be different because they come from different vendors and they're not, they're not standardized. And here, for example, you can see a single infusion pump Type, the bodyguard 545, and the one on the top, to increase the dose you press 2 and to decrease you press 0, whereas the one on the bottom, 
To increase the dose, you press five, and to decrease, you press zero. So why do they produce two completely different um, infusion pumps, um, which have got the same model number? Answer, to save on the regulatory caseload, because they keep on pretending that new product releases are just small variants and old ones. It's rather like we had with cars in the 1930s, where if you bought a, a, if, you know, if you bought a Mercedes, you'd have the accelerator on the right, the, the uh, brake in the middle and the clutch on the left. But if you brought an Armstrong Sidley, the accelerator would be between the brake and the clutch. And if you bought a Model T Ford, um, then of course the accelerator is in the dashboard and the gear change is at your right foot. So if you move from one car to another car, you perhaps wouldn't be able to drive it at all for half a day or so until you practice with it a bit and you'd still be dangerous with it for perhaps weeks afterwards. That's what's now happening in hospitals. And as a result, there's going to be more European-level standardization of this. The Medical Devices Directive is being revised. And there's a good reason for this. In Britain, we reckon um, that infusion pumps alone kill as many people as cars, about 2,000 a year. The incentives for improvement aren't so good because people who die in these accidents uh, tend to be very old or very young or very car crashed. In any case, they're very sick. The deaths aren't unexpected. And in a hospital like that in Cambridge, you might get 10 a year, so it's not the leading cause of death. So the signal gets um, swamped in a whole lot of noise. So what people are going to try and do is to improve the situation so that the regulators uh, do post-approval studies and adverse event reporting. In other words, they're moving towards where the safety community, where the security community is in terms of things like responsible disclosure and patching. Um, there's a little bit further behind because devices tend to be approved in paperwork alone. And those devices which are big and durable um, end up, um, well, are, are basically never patched. At Y2K, for example, the biggest bill that the University of Cambridge had was replacing things like scintillation councils in our clinical department. Lots of devices that cost 50,000 or 100,000 simply could not be upgraded. So how's the world going to change here with the move to security? Well, up until now, it was very difficult to get the regulatory authorities, such as the FDA in America, to pay much attention to safety usability. Because each vendor would say, well, you should standardize on my pump, and then it's everybody else's, which is non-standard. But all of a sudden, this stalemate seems to be broken by the fact that you're getting vulnerabilities reported. And in 2015, for the first time, the FDA blacklisted um, an infusion pump, the Symbic, the, the Symbic from Hospira, uh, and forced hospitals to withdraw it, simply because uh, an attack on this had been reported, which enabled somebody to go in over Wi-Fi, take over the pump, and recalibrate it. So there's going to be some interesting tensions as safety and security come, here, come together here. Now, these tensions go way, way back, because the, the earliest DDoS that we had reported in the press um, was on um, panics, an ISP in New York in about 1998. And the machines used in that attack were largely medical devices in US hospitals. They were devices that were based on Unix workstations and had to remain insecure uh, because the FDA certification required that the operating system uh, be of a certain revision. So what we learned from this is that in medical devices too, we need a proper safety and security life cycle. And we're starting from a bit further behind than cars, and it's going to be complex, but it, you know, there's an awful lot of improvement that's possible. And this is something that's costing um, tens of thousands of lives worldwide every year. The third thing that we looked at was the energy sector. And... The European Network and Information Security Agency reports that the energy sector has got one of the highest rates of attacks on critical national infrastructure. We've seen some examples of this around smart meters in the UK. Now, European countries mostly have a program to replace electricity meters with smart meters, that is, meters that can be read remotely uh, so that the utility company can bill you automatically and in some cases, you can even use your mobile phone to control energy use in your home. But this, of course, means that there's a possibility of remote attack. Now, if you take the 28 million electricity meters in the UK, 
and you replace them with meters that have got a remotely commandable off switch, then that creates a terrible vulnerability, for example, to attack from an unfriendly state. And if Mrs. May upsets the leader of Russia or the leader of China, what's to stop him just sending his hackers to reach out and switch off the electricity in every house in Britain? That's a really, really scary thing to do, because switching off electricity, and in cyber war terms, is the equivalent of a nuclear strike. Once electricity stops, so does everything else. In this part of the world, for example, the destruction of Iraq's electricity power reticulation system in Gulf War II was one of the reasons for the subsequent uprisings in civil war. People just got completely fed up at living in 40 degree temperatures without air conditioning for months and in some cases for years on end. So what happened after we pointed out that this was a big vulnerability was that GCHQ got involved. And the problem there was that they looked at the security of smart meters purely in terms of critical national infrastructure. Their threat model was China turning off 10 million meters at once, right? Because that would get in the way of the signals collection mission, right? If there's no more electricity in Cheltenham or Cornwall, we can't snoop in people's phones and pass the results to the Americans. But they, they were not particularly interested in stopping the power company ripping off individual users or stopping individual users ripping off the power company. So this taught us that there's an agency problem here. If you rely on a single government agency for all the information security functions, you know, from wiretapping through protecting national infrastructure, through protecting end users, individual car drivers, individual electricity consumers, individual users of medical devices, then there may be too many conflicts of interest. The equities problem, as this is known in the intelligence community. What else goes wrong? Well, those of you who have read my book will be aware that one of the highest impact things I ever did was to be involved as one of the designers of the STS prepayment electricity meter specification. And there's now over 400 million meters worldwide which use our spec. Um, so all over Africa, for example, if you want to buy electricity, you go and get a 20-digit number from an ATM or from a phone payment system. You type that into your meter and the electricity comes on. Now, one of the things that we didn't worry, up, worry about enough 25 years ago is that the STS has got a, a day counter that rolls over in 2024, um, affecting 400 million meters, and so all these meters have to be rekeyed. Now, we didn't worry about it too much at the time because we knew that this was a way of fixing the problem, but now that this problem is only a few years out, actually changing all the back-end systems to support rekeying turns out to be a non-trivial task. So that was, if you like, a mistake to which I contributed because back in the early 1990s, as far as I was concerned, 2024 was the unthinkably distant future. Right? Now, here we are actually working on the fix. Another example that we've come across in previous work is that when we were looking at the smart meter and smart grid stuff, one of the problems was how do you go about doing authentication in electricity substations? And um, the problem there is that you have got LANs controlling critical equipment, you know, reclosers, uh, transformers, switches, all sorts of things, um, which use protocols that are incapable of supporting any authentication, just like the aviation protocols that were described in the previous talk. And how do you go about retrofitting message authentication codes, for example, to these protocols? The answer is with difficulty, because the first time people try to use it, they use signatures instead of Macs, which were inappropriate as they were too slow. Second round of um, standard setting you know, lost them about five or six years. And in any case, it will take somewhere between 30 and 40 years to flush out all the old systems and replace them with new systems. So in the meantime, the only way of protecting these old control systems is by re-perimetrization. Okay? The, the time constant of fixing how you run your electricity system is just too long compared with the time, the time constant on which attacks evolve. So you have to do changes at the architectural level. So let me sum up what we figured out so far. The established non-IT industries engineering industries usually have got a fairly static approach. It's pre-market testing for products, whether it's cars, medical devices, um, 
huge big reclosals in electricity substations or even just the electricity meter in your house. Standards change slowly, if at all. Right, car standards for this part of the world are UNECE, which is EU plus Japan plus Australia plus New Zealand plus South Africa plus Tunisia plus Malaysia, you know, all the countries in Europe plus Asia that have got a stake in car manufacturing. And getting everybody to agree is not an instant process. Malicious adversaries, on the other hand, when they find a bug, they can scale it quickly if the vehicle is online. Now, in the old days, if the car was not connected, if a Swedish journalist finds a bug in the Mercedes A-Class, no need to panic. You figure out a fix, you ship the kits, you upgrade the car on the production line. Um, you know, that can be dealt with. But in the future, if somebody finds a series of control inputs for a Mercedes, which will cause the car to accelerate out of control and crash, you've got to patch it. You've got to patch it or scrap it. Right? You cannot have exploitable vulnerabilities at scale in safety critical equipment. And here, the time constant isn't a decade, it's maybe a month. That's, a, that's where the thing is going to get really interesting. Now, in the report that we wrote for the European Union, we highlighted a number of issues. Who's going to investigate incidents and to whom will they be reported? That's something we know about a bit in the IT industry with respons responsible disclosure. So how do we embed that in industries that don't have the culture? How do we bring safety engineers and security engineers together? We go to different conferences. Well, the regulators need to hire security engineers. You know, where are they going to sit? There's 26 agencies in Europe that do this stuff. Europe doesn't employ anybody who really understands cryptography. How do you prevent abuse of lock-in? Right? Because if you regulate that Mercedes must produce patches for its cars for 30 years, they may turn around and say, well, in that case, everybody must use only authorized Mercedes-Benz spare parts. What happens then to the, um, the rest of the spares industry? Incidentally, in the USA, they just put a DMCA exemption for tractors, right, so that people can hack their John Deere and they can get spare parts at low cost because Deere was abusing its lock-in and making everybody angry. Who are the institutional players? Well, there's a whole bunch of regulators. There are standards bodies. There are safety labs. There are security labs. There are, uh, on our side, things like pen testers. There's underwriters labs that belong to the insurance industry. But this is lots and lots of organizations. This is thousands and thousands of people who are currently working in different directions. Then there's other custodians of safety and security standards completely outside our area, like NIST and the IEEE. And then there's non-state bodies like the insurance industry that have got a keen, a keen interest in this. How does all this get coordinated? So the report that we wrote for Europe, which um, you know, should be out in, in June, um, had a number of policy recommendations, including requiring vendors to self-certify for the CE mark that you have to put on every object that's sold in Europe, that their products can be patched if need be. And this, if enforced, would have stopped the uh, DDoS attack that we saw from Mirai in October, because CE says that the product conforms to all applicable um, standards. Now, among these standards are the ISO 29174 and 30111 standards for vulnerability lifecycle management. And if you sell CCTV cameras that have got an embedded uh, root password that you can't change and software that you can't update, then clearly you're not complying with these standards. So if the customs man in Rotterdam had known that, he could have told the ship, right, you can't land these containers in Europe, take them back to China. So we've already, in some sense, got the laws to deal with this. It's just that people are going to become aware of these laws and are going to start enforcing them. There needs to be expertise in Europe, and there's legal stuff that we have to do around product liability so that services don't go through the gap and so that we get proper vulnerability breach reporting. That's on the policy side. On the engineering side, which is obviously the focus of this conference, here's some things to think about. The first is that um, if you've ever used anything like Coverity, you know, a static analysis tool that helps you to find security bugs, whenever Coverity come out with a new version, um, then you suddenly find that um, 
you know, there's another 2,000 bugs in your product. And so your next product version is delayed perhaps by a month or two as you go through and try them and figure out those that are real vulnerabilities and those that you have to patch. So how do you deal with an almost static product in a world where automated attack tools get better every month? And even if you don't intend to change the product functionality at all, the number of vulnerabilities that can easily be found in it continues to improve, cont continues to increase. You're going to have to think in terms of 20-year patching or 30 or 40. And not just that, but of leaving enough extra resource in terms of enough flash and enough RAM or pluggable units, for example, so that you can actually cope um, with what may become a larger product over time. The second thing to learn is that about five years ago, we almost lost one of Britain's big banks, the Royal Bank of Scotland. And the reason was that they went and sacked all their old teams that maintained their old IBM mainframe software on which the branch banking system depended, you know, one of whom, as it happens, was a mate of mine. And he's, he is happily living in retirement in a sunny climb. When what happened? But RBS couldn't service its branch banking systems for a fortnight. And what had happened was that a, a new management uh, that had come into RBS after the 2008 crash was looking to cut costs. So they phoned up various software companies in Bangalore and they said, can you maintain um, IBM mainframe software? And somebody said, sure, you know, confident that they could buy a book on COBOL and muddle through somehow. Now, a lot of this software um, was written in um, System 370 Assembler, which is a rarer skill and one that typically is exercised by guys with gray beards. And so all of a sudden they couldn't keep up with maintenance uh, and, and, and the whole thing went down and was very, very hard to fix, um, almost costing the existence of the bank. So here's, um, if you like, the human factors part of the problem. How do you sustain dev teams who've got the deep application domain knowledge, right? Um, in a world in which there's a fashion to um, continual churn of outsourcing to ever cheaper um, firms overseas, that's going to create a significant tension with products whose maintenance is intrinsically difficult. The next thing that we can learn also from our own experience is the difficulty of patching Android, right? Because uh, the reason that I use a Nexus phone, for example, is it's the only Android phone that's still patched after about a year or so. Everybody else, all the OEMs, typically have you know, 30 or 50 or even 100 programmers who know a bit about Android and who take the current version and customize it, put on the, the phone vendor's welcome screen and so on and so forth. And they're also busy customizing the phone that they're about to launch in a few months' time. But there's never the resource to go back and create Android versions for the Android they were selling a year ago, two years ago, or three years ago. And Google has tried all sorts of tricks over the past six or seven years to try and incentivize um, Android OEMs into agreeing that they'll make patches available. And despite, for example, letting OEMs have access to supply lines that give them components at 100 million off prices, um, many of the vendors um, simply could not be induced uh, to give patching guarantees. And even if they tried, there's the further problem that many of the phones are customized uh, for the phone companies who subsidize the sale. And so you need the approval of both the OEM and the phone company before you can do the patching. And that's just too hard. So there's a motivation issue here that even if the thing is technically possible, how do you do the industrial organization so that it actually happens? Charles have taught us, how do we sustain all the test environments? Now, it's difficult enough if you're doing software research to revive old code. If you've got a version of your systems experiment that one of your students did a year ago or two years ago, then very often you can't get it working because something about the environment changes, right? You can't compile the tools anymore. With cars, as I mentioned, this is hard because each lab car is typically a huge rack of equipment that you get from someone like DSpace in Germany, costs you at least $50,000, and that price is going to go up and up and up as cars become more complex and they get more and more components in them, um, you know, which... Um, uh, which have to be tested against anything that you um, produce. How do you sustain that? Well, my own feeling is that as cars uh, become more complex, 
So the cost of repair goes up uh, because of all the components that can be damaged. For example, last week I went into the garage that we use near our village and I spoke to the, uh, the owner of the garage about this and he said, yeah, see that Volvo in that bay there? I said, yeah. Oh, no, ding the wing, mirror, the wing mirror, he said. It's 900 quid to fix that wing mirror. Uh, previously, you might have spent 100 quid to fix a wing mirror, but now, as this is a smarter car, the wing mirror has got sensors for automatic lane keeping. So not only did they have to replace this expensive camera and its little computer assembly, but he had to take the car off to Volvo in Bedford so that they could realign this on their fancy rig with all the maps with fancy printing on it. So the people who sell spare wing mirrors are going to be making money from maintaining cars in good running order. And in fact, the insurance guys say that the cost of insurance is beginning to go up because of this. And so presumably there's some business model comes along whereby the component makers who benefit from this will be contributing something towards the cost of uh, doing the maintenance. But anyway, that's still to be worked on. The um, next thing that we have been looking at is the fact that the tool chain can be a tribulation. Now, if you think about cryptography, and some of us here have been working with cryptography for 20 years or so, what actually breaks about cryptography? Well, if you start off with keys that are too small, like the 48-bit keys in MyFair Classic, then hey, you've got a problem. But that's not what's broken about things like TLS, is it? Not since the end of Crypto War One. TLS was verified secure by my colleague Larry Paulson in um, 1999. Okay. Now Lars Knudsen, with whom I worked on Serpent, used to have in his SIG. If it's provably secure, it probably isn't. Right. Now, so TLS is provably secure, and if you go and look at Kenny Patterson's website, you'll see that it's broken about once a year for the last 15 years. Now, go and look at these breaks, and they're all about implementation detail. They're about some um, obscure feature of session resumption that fell outside the scope of the original um, verification. Um, they're about um, guys like Dan Bernstein coming up with ever more subtle timing attacks, ways of doing remote exploits on um, implementations such as OpenSSL. And we end up having, in effect, um, a single point of failure because this huge piece of crafty code um, in OpenSSL has got all these patches in it to prevent odd protocol glitches, to prevent timing attacks to prevent memory scavenging, which can find keys and shared machines in the cloud. And it tends to be fragile, and there's only a small number of people who actually know how to maintain it. That's how things might break at scale. That's how things break repeatedly. So in the case of trying to make software more sustainable in the crypto sense, we come up with a different set of problems. So what we're trying to do is to see to it that some loops execute in constant time. We want to ensure that you don't get an obvious dependency on the time that it takes to do an AES encryption on whether the S-box ended up in the cache or not. If somebody's doing um, an RSA private key operation, you don't want to have a notably different amount of time um, spent on um, squaring from and multiplying. There's all sorts of things like that that people have to work over quite carefully. And the problem is that doing these padding op operations is difficult because your compiler is forever trying to remove them because it sees that we don't have um, an obvious effect on the output. So you have to very carefully craft your padding operations. And the same goes when you're trying to zero key memory after use. This is particularly important in a world of cloud services where people are running stuff on um, cloud platforms and where one of the obvious attacks is just to go and rent some machines, get lots and lots of memory, look at it, and see if anybody left an interesting crypto key there. So when you're writing this kind of code, what you're trying to do is to zeroize key memory. And again, that's difficult because of compiler upgrades. You get your software running, and you test it, 
and you're happy that it's secure. And then next Tuesday, all of a sudden, it isn't secure anymore because some very clever PhD student just checked in his latest fancy optimization code and it found its way into GCC or whatever. And it spots that your carefully crafted padding instructions don't affect the output value. So out they come. And it optimizes them away and suddenly your code is vulnerable to timing attack. So it's as if you know, you've got a subversive fifth column in the rear because here you are trying to fight the, the bad guys. And every so often, this subversive element behind you comes and stabs you in the back. Now, this is, if you like, another kind of um, conflict between the traditional approach to dependability, which tends to be too much about performance, and uh, the requirements of security. Although it must be said, um, the compiler writers can also mess up on the safety front too, because you can end up with a situation where code has been carefully designed so that its worst case execution um, um, is, is bounded in some important way. And then the compiler comes along and optimizes it in such a way that the worst case actually becomes worse uh, because the average case is becoming better. In other words, what's happening is that we have got difficulty in communicating programmer intent to our software tool chain. And at the same time, the tool chain is becoming more complex as different interest groups ask it to do different, different things. So in a separate piece of work, um, my postdoc Laurent Simon has been working with David Chisnell, the lab's compiler expert and me, and has created a Clang LLVM plugin to support erasure of sensitive memory. Now the idea here is that we create a framework in which you can communicate programmer intent explicitly to the compiler. And what we do is use annotations. So if you want, for example, to see to it that a, a function doesn't leak information after it's returned, then you annotate it with zero on return. And when you start looking at the internals of this, you need compiler support in order to do it properly because the internals of a modern compiler are getting very, very seriously complicated and there's all sorts of side channels and things that can go wrong that you have to think of. Now this paper's under submission, but you know, you're most welcome to ask for a copy if this falls within your interests. So here's some topics for keen students. It's not just about constant time code, but also about other code side effects. Then what happens if you're doing countermeasures to fault injection, such as Rohammer? Right? We have all learned in the last year or two that this is a serious problem. And so people have gone back to defensive programming. Now, back in the 1950s, people did defensive programming because computers used valves, and valves break. And, and, and they also have intermittent faults. And, so if you masked off three bits, um, you know, you would check that the result wasn't greater than seven before you used it. But try doing that with a modern compiler. It will say, well, this result clearly can't do anything, and so it will optimize it away. So if you are working on something like Rohammer, don't just stop at doing the tests and saying, hey, I got the key, or come up with a countermeasure and say, well, you know, um, this appears to work. Try to think a little bit further. Try to think into the tool chain. Try to think about how this works as an actual industrial process. Now, this brings me back to something that I, in fact, did for my thesis years and years and years ago, back in the days of the dinosaurs. And one of the things that I argued in my thesis is that if you wanted security protocols to be robust in that they wouldn't break so often, and one of the things that you had to think about was explicitness. Because very often what would happen is that somebody would design a decent security protocol, and then somebody else would come along and optimize it, and they'd remove something that was actually doing some work without realizing it, because there was confusion between what was explicit and what was implicit. And so if you want to get robust security in the protocols field, you've got to do explicitness. And this seems to be essential for language security too. Anyway, that's the latest thing that we've done in this field. We began to realize about November last year that long-term maintainability, that sustainability, if you want, was going to be an increasingly important um, thing for security engineers in the years ahead, just as it has been in various ways for the dependability and safety community. And as these communities come together, we're going to have to start thinking about this stuff. <laughs>
So what I've touched on in this talk to summarize is that we've had a hard look last year about what's going wrong with the security of durable goods. And I believe that in future, security will be more about safety rather than mostly about privacy. And this is going to change a whole lot of stuff. It changes the politics of regulation. It will even change the politics of surveillance because many people might be prepared to give the FBI a golden master key to your iPhone in order to enable your phone to be tapped. But fewer people would be prepared to give the FBI a golden master key which would enable them to crash your car. And so debates about cryptography policy won't just be about the defense and intelligence people, it'll be about the Ministry of Transport, the Ministry of Health, and all sorts of government functions, which I hope will bring a more balanced and reasonable view of that problem. There are institutional factors beyond government, such as whether the capability to patch resides in one company or several. We've already seen that if you buy, for example, a Samsung phone, what's the incentive on Samsung to produce a new version of Android for that in two years' time? Answer, not enough. So what happens if you buy a car from Mercedes and in three years' time or five years' time it needs a safety patch for some sub-assembly that is made by Bosch or ZF? Will the corporate incentives necessarily line up? What happens to the long-tail liability? What happens to the insurance industry's role? What happens to um, cars in 25 years' time once they've ended their life in Europe and they've been put on boats and arrived at Mombasa and they're being driven around in, in Africa? Who's going to do the maintenance then? Is that going to be an open source thing? Who's going to maintain your security code in 25 years' time when there's no money in it anymore? And this, is, this isn't something that we can avoid. Because if you've got safety-critical durable goods and they can be attacked online at scale in a way that will cost lots of lives, there's a simple choice. You patch them or you scrap them. Right? And if car makers decide, for example, that in future no software will be maintained after 20 years and all cars will stop dead forever on their 20th birthday, then how are people in Africa going to get cars? So, up until now, much of software engineering has been about cutting the cost of maintenance. That's why we have objects, right? You don't make a programmer that much more productive doing initial coding in Java or C++ compared with their, pro their, their, their productivity in Fortran or COBOL. But what you do is you make the software more maintainable because programming in a modern language causes people to use abstraction properly. It causes them to um, basically be better computer scientists. But ultimately, at the economic level, this is about costs of maintenance. And we're about to get this in security engineering big time. This is going to be a lot of the future. So the sort of things that we have to start thinking about, can we reduce attack surfaces so that only some sub-assemblies need regular patching? you have a, car, a firewall in the car that you can simply replace every five years? Or firewalls acting as gateways between the different buses in the car? This might be an approach which reflects the approach that people are having to take in the world of industrial control systems. How can we test whole product families cheaply? Does this mean that the innards of a car, the electronic innards, are going to have to maintain more stability over time across many models? Well, that's how you manage to get engines dependable. But at a time when you've got rapid innovation in self-driving, how do you make that all add up? Now, it would be great if you could get all the self-driving function into a, a, a robot chauffeur that would sit there, you know, like in a sci-fi movie, like Schwarzenegger just physically driving the car. But it ain't going to happen that way because many of the things that are used for automatic driving have to go on the, the main bus. Right, your stability control needs to know the direction of your steering wheel so that it knows driver intention and can vector the thrust and interact with the brakes and so on. Too much of this is all tied up together. So how can you test whole product families cheaply? Can you come up with a better way of doing security certification of assemblies that contain perhaps 30 or 40 different CPUs doing different things? And incidentally, that's already a problem with mobile phones, which contain many CPUs. How can we make the tool chain our ally? 
it's not just about compilers taking away security code. It's about the fact that compilers tend to bloat. Where can we get incentives for minim minimalism? It doesn't come in the open source community because every PhD student wants to check his code into GCC so that he can tick the box on his CV and go and get a job with Google. So open source compilers get bigger and bigger. What do we do about that? And at heart, the philosophical question is this. Does security set new limits to complexity? Are we the guys that everybody's going to be complaining about in 20 years' time? Is it the security limits that will stop people doing more cool stuff uh, with autonomy and with automation? That's something that may be an opportunity. It's something that may cause a lot of problems. I don't know, but it's something that we have to start thinking about. Finally, um, if you need the background to this, um, there's always my book. Um, hey, <laughs> I did predict in it that we were heading for a world with lots of autonomous stuff, uh, but you know the directions of it um, are interesting and you know, will give us lots of challenges in the year ahead. Thanks.